Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here. And yes, I finally saw the film. I actually saw the film twice already in theaters. A reboot of the most popular franchise of all time, which is the original film that became one of my favorite films of all time. Yeah, from 1984 which would spawn off an animated series and they brought in the high C ecto cooler to be part of lots of merchandising that went into it not to mention they had a sequel to the original film and it became a culture phenomenon yes I'm talking about the new reboot Ghostbusters from 2016 that features an all-female cast free scientists and an MTA worker plus a receptionist who's a male yep this is a new film that Paul Feig had directed with um, the CEO of Sony Pictures Amy Pascal who produced the film yeah well I'm going to say this right off the bat. I didn't hate the film, nor love it either. But I would say this, it's totally forgettable. Yeah, it's more of a time waster, so I, I guess I could take it for what it's worth. But it's not the greatest. It has its funny moments, and I gotta admit, I did laugh when I saw the film, especially seen it twice already with my family I mean I saw it once uh, by myself you know just to see what all the fuss is all about you know mostly because I was taking the risk you know having to hear all the controversy that this movie went for because I figured you know I, I had a gut reaction that this movie for better or worse would probably be okay I mean maybe it would be a whole lot better than the trailers TV spots and all the marketing that it went into yeah because trust me <laughs> it was hard to take now I know it started out as being simply Ghostbusters free because they were in development for a very long time you know Dan Aykroyd wanted to work on that so with the original cast returning but the problem was Bill Murray um, didn't want to do this neither is all the other cast so they figured, well, they had to move on. I mean, they had to do other stuff. And by the time Dan Aykroyd was working on the script for Ghostbusters 3, because the original title was going to be called Hellbent, um, Bill Murray just couldn't uh, deal with it. So he, he actually um, read the script and he thought it was terrible. So he didn't want to get involved in this, for better or worse. So they knew they were going to get someone else to replace him and yep it was going to be Ben Stiller but in years that followed and, and seeing that this film had been in development for a very long time and yeah, development hell that they decided to make a video game that's based on the first two films and the fact that um, it added a new plot uh, towards the, the video game so that's where Dan Aykroyd actually claimed that this is actually the third film. Now, okay, I guess I can sense that too, but even I kind of disagree saying that Ghostbusters the video game was the third film, per se. Because it's a video game, guys, okay? It's not a movie, and it was never meant to be. I mean, sure, it has all the footages and all that stuff, but you're just playing a video game, okay? <laughs> I want to see the real movie. That's what I wanted to see as a Ghostbusters fan. But, but hey, you know, this was released at the time when I hardly ever play video games anymore. So I started buying mostly movies, you know, being a movie buff and all. But now I, I feel like I totally made a big mistake. And, and looking back at it, I would say that they're right all along. I was wrong that... Ghostbusters the video game is the third film. 
and that's the only way we can have it. No doubt about it. And maybe someday I will get the game, but I gotta get another system if I could. I mean, if maybe I might get a PlayStation free someday, but I don't know if that's ever gonna happen. But who knows? Otherwise, I could just get the game um, from the Wii or Xbox 360 because I know we do have um, those systems. So who knows? We'll see. But. They've been trying to work on it for a very long time. You know, Harold Ramis thought, well, maybe he'll try to see what he can come up with. And then, because of all this had been going on for so long, that it was never going to happen. And on top of that, Harold Ramis passed away in 2014. And then, Bill Murray was already receiving some threats. Um, on his email mostly because of the so-called Sony hack that they were actually threatening him to sue him because he didn't want to participate so because of all of this even beforehand Sony decided to announce that they were going to do a reboot and they were going to have Paul Fee to direct so he can do his version of Ghostbusters with a female cast, you know, some of which were in all of his other films that he has done, like Bridesmaids, The Heat, and Spy, at this rate, Marissa McCarthy. So then, that's what causes its controversy, because people were angry about it, mostly because they don't like the idea of being a reboot, because apparently they've been getting so many reboots these days, for the past couple years. I mean, we've been getting a lot of remakes and reboots of 80s movies, as well as some 90s and 70s and all those other years that followed, that people got tired of it. And I understand too, because I felt the same way. You know, I, I've i been seeing a lot of remakes and reboots too, and they were horrible in comparison. But this movie... That's where I started feeling skeptical and optimistic about it because of the idea. I had no problem having a female cast because I am not, and I'm going to say this, I am not a misogynist, a sexist, or even a racist. Okay? I was okay with having a female cast no matter what they do. I never had a problem with that. and. And I never had a problem with uh, having you know, African Americans or anybody else to deal with or having to have a stereotype at some point or another, even though they, they do get old really fast. I never had a problem with it in the first place. So the problem is, however, is that I wonder if this movie is going to be any good. That's what I'm afraid of, okay? Because I was hoping that this movie, for better or worse, will be good. And that's what we got. And because of all this, you know, all the fans out there, there are a lot of rabid fans out there who loves Ghostbusters, but they keep going around saying all these negative comments on Twitter or any other website. And this is where... Paul Fee just gets really angry about this, that he decided he's just going to respond to them, saying all this crap. Now, I have met the guy. He's a nice man. I love Paul Fee. But if I were him, I would ignore all the trolls that started printing all this negativity towards him. Don't look at the comments, okay? If you look at the comments, just ignore it. That's what a professional should do. They should just ignore everything that they had to say. Okay? That's their loss. Okay? Don't don't feed the trolls. Okay? I've been in that situation too. Trust me. It sucks. But I learned my lesson. So, at least I apologize. But I hope Paul will definitely feel the same next time if he ever deals with this crap again. And I know he's been dealing with that too just recently because 
Uh, actress uh, Leslie Jones um, got attacked too, just after the film got released on Twitter. Yeah, another example of cyberbullying that causes her to delete her account, or at this rate, close it. And, I know, that sucks too. She deserved better than that. And I feel sorry for her because of it too. And, and I definitely feel sorry for Paul Feig having to get involved in this garbage. But, what can you do? What can you do? But, with that aside, this movie deserves better. It really does. You know, it just doesn't feel like it has the, the spark and energy that the original film have. And that was the problem. And I just hope that, you know, they will definitely learn a lesson from all of this. That when you do a movie like Ghostbusters, you do you do your research properly. Just to know that Dan Aykroyd, you know, the writer who came up with the idea, because this was part of his uh, pet project, was that he wanted to create a movie that's that could definitely uh, greet the audience and and definitely get to see what was it like if we have so many ghosts floating around the entire city and you want to have heroes that are scientists who are smart and have intelligence can actually save the world think about it I mean they're basically exterminators for ghosts so I, I know it's been done already with some of the earlier attempts uh, for Ghostbusters I mean we did have the 70s series Ghostbusters and we did have uh, the, the cartoon version from Filmation that's based on the idea. Hell, we even got an earlier cartoon from Disney, which we have uh, Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, and Goofy, you know, portraying as the Ghostbusters. Long before we even had this movie, but this was just his whole different experience of it. And, he, and with the help of writer Harold Ramis, that this movie really became... A culture phenomenon. The idea of catching ghosts in a whole different way, but they're also experiencing paranormal activity. So they know what they're trying to do before they save the world. And that's what I love about that. And plus it has smart writing. All these memorable quotes that you just never forget. And you got a great cast right there. You got a wonderful score especially um, the theme song by Ray Parker Jr., which actually written it out as basically something out of a commercial, um, but it's also destined to have a lawsuit by um, singer Huey Lewis because it was similar to that song that he did called I Want a New Drug. But nevertheless, you know, he, he lost the battle and, and he won. <laughs> So at least he now got his version of, of the theme song we all know and love. So let's get to the movie. It stars Mercer McCarthy, Christian Wiig, Kate McKinnon from SNL, along with Leslie Jones, Chris Hemsworth, C. Lee Strong, Annie Garcia, Neil Casey, Charles Dance, you know, from the movie The Golden Child and Last Action Hero. Michael Kenneth Williams, Matt Walsh, Ed Bigley Jr., with cameo appearances by the original Ghostbusters cast, Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, Sigourney Weaver, Ernie Hudson, Annie Potts, also other cameos like Ozzy Osbourne, Al Roker, Pat Kiernan, Rosanna Scott Dio, and Greg Kelly. It's written by Paul Feig, along with Kate Depoy, you know, which they teamed up together since uh, Bridesmaids, as well as uh, The Heat, and last year's Spy. And of course, it's directed by Paul Feig. The movie began set in the Overridge Mansion in New York City, where a group of people are taking a tour 
We meet a tour guide named Garrett, who's played by Zach Woods, who tells a story about a disturbed woman named Gerwood Ulrich, where he was kept locked inside the basement by her father. Suddenly, a candlestick that fell all over the table, which that's already near the basement, just to scare the group off. And just when Garrett was ready to close down the mansion later on, he suddenly hears noises coming near the basement. Yeah, where the doorknob starts to move as it turns, and then it starts to shake up, actually scaring him by screaming. And then he ran off, just trying to find a place to hide. And he actually threw the chair onto the ghost, and then the ghost actually threw him back. Yeah, and then when he went inside the basement, locked himself in, suddenly a huge glob of slime that's coming right straight up from the ground and was ready to attack him. That's when he screams, No! 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 <laughs> yeah, basically similar to the scene in the original film where it was set in the library and the ghost attacks a librarian. So that's where we get to the opening which they played the original Way Parker Jr. theme, classic theme as you know it, and we get to the Columbia University where we meet a physics professor, Dr. Aaron Gilbert, who's played by Christian Wig, who just found out that a publisher Ed Mulgrave, who's played by A. Bakley Jr., who has a book that Aaron and her best friend and colleague Abby Yates, who's played by Marissa McCarthy, have wrote, you know, about the paranormal activity and all the, uh, the existence of ghosts. Which, apparently, she wasn't very proud of. They didn't sell very well. But Abby's uh, idea was she wanted to sell it on Amazon.com. She decided to go to a technical college where Abby attends. And she now has a new partner named Dr. Julian Holtzman, who's played by Kate McKinnon. Which basically they learned years later that to republish the book, they threatened her to bid for tenure at, at Columbia. Which Gilbert had to reunite with Yates again to exchange for getting the book of a publication. So he agrees to assist Yates and Holtzman for a paranormal investigation. So they witness uh, the ghost that was inside uh, the Orbridge mansion and that's where they brought in the equipment. I mean she Abby just brought in the, her camera just to film. Yeah, Julian you know being this awkward and weird you know just brought in some Pringles and just brought in one of her gadgets that she just created to see if, if they could capture it. And then Aaron is just there just trying to see you know what the ghost looks like and I know she even slipped up some slime uh, that came from the floor. <laughs> Seems like this is about to happen to her every time. Yeah. And um, that's when they met uh, the ghost Gerrit Ulrich, which that's where we get to see the scene that's in the trailer, of course, was she actually vomits with slime all over her face, Aaron's face, and that's where they got the whole footage that's already being sent on YouTube of a publication. So he agrees to assist Yates and Holtzman for a paranormal investigation. So they witness uh, the ghost that was inside uh, the Orbridge mansion, and that's where they brought in the equipment. I mean, she, Abby just brought in the, her camera just to film. Yeah, Julian, you know, being this awkward and weird, you know, just brought in some Pringles and just brought in one of her gadgets that she just created to see if, if they could capture it. And then Aaron is just there just trying to see you know what the ghost looks like and I know she even slipped up some slime uh, that came from the floor <laughs> seems like this is about to happen to her every time yeah and um, that's when they met uh, the ghost 
Gerbert Ulrich, which that's where we get to see the scene that's in the trailer, of course, was... She actually vomits with slime all over her face, Aaron's face. And that's where they got the whole footage that's already being sent on YouTube. And that's when Aaron had screamed and told them that the ghosts are real. So they re so that way everybody can believe in, in ghosts. But that alone just got them into trouble because now Aaron Gilbert has been fired by the Dean Harold Fillmore who's played by Charles Dance. Mostly because he's up for tenure. Not only that, but Albie and Holtzman had got fired from their technical college by a dean who, yeah, happens to be a jerk, who just actually flips the bird and actually says, go suck it. <laughs> so they got all the equipment that they need and they decided to move in into a new place, their, their new office. At first they were going to get the, the hooks and ladders uh, abandoned the firehouse that they were going to use for their headquarters, yeah, just like in the original film. Unfortunately, it was too expensive. They decided to have their office inside a Chinese food restaurant. Yep, because that's where we see Abby complaining with a takeout employee who's been sending her some wonton soup. Yep, and this is a running gag in the film where you know, she's always complaining about wonton soup because she's always obsessed with it. You know, she loves wonton soup so much that she just, you know, she just want to have the soup with tons of meat inside, which basically just looks like a tub of piss. <laughs> yeah, and, and I swear to God, it, it's not even funny. I didn't find that hilarious when, when it comes to her talking about wonton soup. It just makes me not want to have wonton soup. <laughs> Come on, man, seriously. I mean, where's the joke there? But, okay, okay. I digress. But, meanwhile, we do meet an MTA subway worker named Patty Tolan, who's played by Leslie Jones, who witnessed a ghost inside the subway tunnel, which turns out to be a prisoner. As she ran away and, and contacts the department, you know, Abby, Aaron, and Holtzman had just came up with their new name of the department called the Conductors of Metaphysical Examination. And not only that, but they also hired um, a dim-witted, yeah, who's a complete idiot, but he's also very handsome and a hunk, named Kevin Bakeman, who's played by Chris Hemsworth. You know, who just wears uh, geeky glasses with no glass on them. And, you know, he's also started to create a logo f for the team. Yeah, at first it was that ghost logo with boobs. <laughs> I got to admit, I did laugh at that scene. And then later he started creating other logos like the 7-Eleven logo that's already been taken. Yeah, hard to believe. And then there's another one where it has the hot dog on top. That's floating uh, with a house. So that didn't work out. So he, he got the job. Trying to find a table. but Because <laughs> unfortunately the phone is on the fish tank. And all this other stuff that went into. So <laughs> there you go. Anyway. But uh, getting to that. Uh, Patty uh, had contacted them to actually go down to the subway. For the group to investigate. And they decided to film the, the video just to prove them that they're wrong. So they, they found the ghost by using the Holtzman's proton contaminated laser. You know, that's already been successfully tested. Where they, they finally um, ready to shoot the, the ghost. So that way they'll be able to capture it. And, yep, they send the video once again on viral, but unfortunately everybody just dismiss it as just being fake. Yeah, if you, if you saw the YouTube uh, page, you could tell that you could see likes, and the other one just has a few dislikes, but then the comments are all negative and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, they're going to go for that, too, already since the trailers had plenty of dislikes already. 
<laughs> but for different reasons. On the news, they, they spotted the video, and then they begin to discover who they really are. And, of course, they just, they call their names, as we speak, Ghostbusters. So now, um, they finally uh, got their first job, just after uh, Patty just brought in a hearse, a Cadillac, that is, coming from her uncle, because her uncle works at a funeral home. Yeah, I'm going to explain that too, because he's actually played by Ernie Hudson. Yeah, his name is Bill Jenkins. Anyway, which he only appears at the end of the movie. Uh, Holtzman actually worked on the, the hearse, which turned out to be the new Ecto-1. And yes, it even has that, that sound that sounds like a car alarm. And Now, in comparison with the original, yes, because I am comparing it to it, the original Ecto-1 that came straight out of a, uh, a Cadillac car, uh, they actually had a sound, an alarm sound, that's so different that that's probably the most memorable uh, alarm that you'll ever hear. Yeah, the, that particular siren, such as, eh, 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 eh. Yeah, that kind of siren. This siren that they use was like this. That's how it was. I'll take the original any day. But what's also interesting about that car was that this one only runs 18 V horsepower, while the original only runs at 38 V horsepower. Yeah, go figure. <laughs> well, anyway, they went to the concert. Because they discovered that there's a ghost uh, hidden inside. And yes, it was an Ozzy Osbourne concert, but they'd also have another band too to play. And suddenly, Patty uh, went inside of the room. And that's when she found a mannequin that's being possessed by the ghost. And the ghost turned out to be a ghost dragon. The mannequin was chasing her around and, and the Ghostbusters were there just to stop it until the ghost dragon appears and then it just went all the way straight on stage with the band and and that's when they arrived just ready to uh, capture the ghost I mean Abby was just about to jump over with the crowd and then Patty decided to join in with her but then you know he fell on the but then she fell on the ground and and this is where you hear that line that's yep in the trailer Yes, I, I know I have to mention it because it happened. Where she says, I don't know if this is a race fan or a lady fan, but I'm bad as hell. Give me up! That's right. It's all in there. <laughs> I, I, I thought they were going to cut that out, but they didn't. <laughs> they kept it in. Well, anyway, um, the ghost dragon was on top of her, and she was about to rock very slowly. Yeah, one fan actually took out a selfie stick and took a picture of it. And yes, the Ghostbusters was ready to to shoot the, the ghost uh, dragon and capture it on their ghost trap that they created. And there you go. <laughs> they got it. And the band continues to go on, and yes, with uh, Holtzman actually smashing the guitar... And then that's where you see Ozzy Osbourne acting like he was in the TV show The Osbournes on MTV saying, Sharon! And like that. And then after all of this, um, because they finally uh, saved everybody from the ghost, yeah, they now reveal themselves as the Ghostbusters. And then suddenly we meet Dr. Martin Heist, who's played by Bill Murray. Yeah, so he has a cameo in the film, and boy, I, I already know about this by the moment I saw that this was going to happen to him, because unfortunately, he didn't believe about what they did, so they considered to be frauds already, mostly from the mayor of New York, uh, named um, Bradley, who was played by Annie Garcia along with the assistant, uh, J. 
Jennifer Lynch is played by Celie Strong, along with Officer Stevenson and all the rest. So that way, you know, they don't want to be part of this this mess that's happening. Yeah, part of the mass hysteria. <laughs> yeah, they even throw in some quotes from the original film too in the mix. And also we have a villain who's very weak, um, named Rowan North, who's played by. Neil Casey, who wants to create uh, the fourth capitalism, so he basically has this plan to actually wipe out uh, the Ghostbusters and all the rest of, of the entire people throughout the entire city. So now it becomes, you guessed it, the apocalypse. And yeah, he's been bullied all of his life, too, as he claimed, but now he's going to become the bully himself. <laughs> There you go. So he's coming up with all of his machines that he has and basically he kills himself too by actually getting onto the machine. Yeah, he electrocuted himself. And I, I know inside his room he has a lot of uh, frames where they show a lot of ghosts uh, moving their hands around like that, placing them on, onto the, the frame, all the frame mirrors right there. Yeah, doing all that. So that was like, wow. <laughs> but then when Martin Heist had came over you know, to their office just to explain to them if, if everything they have captured is real. But of course, you know, he wanted the Aaron to open the, the ghost uh, trap so that way he can see it. To see if they're not lying or not. Yeah. Oh God, and and I hated this scene too because I, it does make me feel uncomfortable having to see that. Where basically Martin tells um, Aaron that about their suit that you look like you just came right out of a a garbage truck or something. Yeah, because I know their suits that they wore look like something out of uh, Caltrans, but those were the suits that uh, that. Uh, Patty had created so yeah that you could tell because they all look like uh, Caltrans suits you know all orange lines and brown you know all the jumpsuits like that and of course I know they suit up uh, with all the proton packs that they use and everything that they got yeah, all of that <laughs> well anyway they open the trap and this is when he says Casper and then he then he flew all the way up to the window, got killed. Yeah, he went all the way down to the pavement of the building while the ghost dragon escapes. You know, this is why I'm getting sick and tired of having to see Bill Murray getting killed off in the movie. Okay, if you want to see a better death scene, check out Zombieland. I mean, he played himself in the movie. I thought that worked. But th this is getting old real fast. And I just didn't like that scene at all. <sighs> so, of course, that's that's had to happen. So, now Rowan is already being possessed as a ghost. And now he's ready to go after um, the crew. Just when Aaron was about to read the book to find out about Rowan's plans... This is where, because um, Rowan is also an artist himself, he actually created the, the Forced Catholicism that he put up on his book that he got. And um, suddenly, Rowan actually possessed Abby inside the bathroom. And yes, this is where we get the, the Exorcist reference. Yeah. <laughs> <Where> <laughs> Where uh, Abby was just ready to throw uh, Holtzman out of the window. Yeah, the same place where yeah, Martin Heist got killed. And then <laughs> he already grabbed him. And then Abby's head was about to turn. And <laughs> and I got to admit, I laughed at that scene too. Because that's I, I thought that was hilarious. I have to admit. I, I got to admit though, even though I thought it was ridiculous at first. I, I laughed just because of how... <laughs> How fucking messed up it was. But yes, uh, Patty actually started screaming and, and he says, Get out of my friend, run! 
And, and then Abby says, oh, that's going to leave a mark. And he says, the power of Penny compels you! <laughs> okay, I, I'm sorry. It, it just gets to me somehow. And then Rowan suddenly went straight into uh, Kevin, who's already dressed up as a Ghostbuster. You know, he brought in the motorcycle and and uh, and he had the helmet too. Suddenly he gets possessed, and now he's becoming, you know, Rowan inside his body and just ready to create the the apocalypse that he's been planning on. Um, I know they were all testing out on all their gadgets. Yeah, where they had. The Proton Punch, yeah, just when they use it as a target for the ghost. Yeah, I, I have to say that was a funny scene right there. And, and then they were using all these other targets, all these other gadgets that she created, so it just makes it look really good. So in case they capture all of them and they kill them, so there you go. <laughs> because all of this is about to happen, Aaron decided to let uh, the mayor and Jennifer that it is coming. Because Aaron just went inside the restaurant, you know, letting them know, yes, she's like pounding on the window, just telling them that it's going to happen. But of course, Aaron actually told uh, Bradley that, uh, please don't act like the mayor from Jaws. And then Bradley's like saying, oh, please don't compare me to the, the mayor from Jaws, or something like that. And, and of course, they kicked her out, and... And then it, the whole thing just began, you know, the, the the apocalypse, and tons of ghosts were fleeing around the entire city, and Aaron was just ready to find a taxi cab just to find uh, the crew, you know, so that way they can, she can suit up and and help them out. But of course, when she went inside the taxi, that's where she meets a taxi cab driver. Who was played by Dan Aykroyd? Yes, and this is where he says, "Yeah, in, in that New York uh, accent, that sort of way." Uh, I don't take wackles and and all of that, and I ain't afraid of no ghost. That's right. He actually used the line from the classic uh, Ray Parker Jr. theme song. Yeah, I ain't afraid of no ghost. He refuses. He drove off, and he, he was trying to. And Aaron was trying to find a way to, to stop him. So then the team had arrived with the Ecto-1 and just ready to um, kill all the ghosts, capturing them, or just basically just killing them all off throughout the entire city. Yes, there's even a scene where we get to meet Slimer. Only a short scene, sadly. But yes, Slimer just came up from the food carts burping, and then he actually takes their Ecto-1 <laughs> and drives off, and suddenly he has a girlfriend, <laughs> along with all the other ghosts, yeah, for a ride, and, <laughs> oh my god, I, I, I know, I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm just getting to that, and then there's also a ghost parade, because that's where we got to see Stay Puft Marshmallow Man as a ghost balloon, and yes, it's already been popped. As Holtzman, Abby, and Leslie have already been, already been squashed, but Aaron came to the rescue by using a Swiss Army knife and pop it. So they continue to go around fighting more ghosts. Yeah, they even kill the Pilgrim. And on top of that, um, they're ready to save uh, Kevin by going inside the Makano at the hotel, because I know at the beginning... I know uh, during that one scene, the you know, Annie Potts, who played Vanessa in the film, the hotel desk clerk, she's basically playing her Janine character. Yeah, you can even tell from the glasses and the looks. She's saying, "What do you want?" Yeah, there you go. But and already ready to attack a uh, Rowan, and they they got uh, Kevin, so he's safe, even though he's already unconscious. That's where he turns himself into the no ghost logo. Yeah, which is which is this one. Yeah, this the same no ghost logo as as you spotted inside the the subway which um, a graffiti artist had created. 
Yeah, I gotta admit, that was a funny scene, too. It's all animated, just like uh, the animated bumpers from the real Ghostbusters series. And suddenly, he grows up to become a giant ghost, ready to attack the city and attack them. And on top of that, yes, they use their proton guns to shoot it straight into the balls. Go figure. <laughs> okay, okay, I gotta admit though, I mean, it doesn't bother me that much when I had to see someone get kicked in the nuts or anything like that, but they had to go for that, so there you go. So they were ready to uh, stop the ghost the, from the No Ghost logo, and yeah, it's actually called the Moogly, as the director pointed out, uh, Ivan Reitman. So they went all the way straight inside the portal, where, where that's into a dimension that's about to send all the way down, yeah, including the ghost, which apparently Slimer and his girlfriend, along with all the ghosts driving around the Ecto-1, because it has a nuke inside, actually went inside the portal, explodes, and yep, there's even a scene that's a reference to Die Hard, at this rate, Die Hard 2. So then, uh, Abby and Aaron were just ready to um, go inside the, the portal, yeah, because Aaron was about to save Abby, just as they stopped the no ghosts, and he finally went all the way down. And now, the portal had finally been shut off, they escape from there, and then all their hair has become completely white now. <laughs> so there you go. So the whole world has been saved, and they finally got their, their headquarters uh, that they've been wanting to have all this time, and they finally got it. And that's when we meet um, Patty's uncle explaining about the, the hearse that he had, and yeah, and they argue together, and and then the film ends, which leads to all the uh, the mid credit scenes. Uh, yes, we even get to spot uh, Sigourney Weaver um, playing the uh, Holtzman's uh, mentor, basically saying about safety glasses are for dudes. And, <laughs> yes, and, and then all this other stuff that went into when Holtzman was about to create another. Uh, gadget that she did, you know, that traps all the ghosts and all that, yeah, or even kill them, all of that. Yeah, there, and there's subwaters too, even the scene where, <laughs> you know, where Kevin already pr being possessed by Rowan is just dancing around, you know, doing some, all, all this other crazy moves, you know, almost feeling like something out of uh, Michael Jackson's Thriller, you know, all of this. Yeah, I'm going to say this right off the bat. It had its funny moments, but then there are other times when it's just not funny. I think the movie could have been a whole lot better if they didn't go for all these offensive jokes and Boeing male bashing and all that other stuff. It was not needed. They didn't need to put that in. It just doesn't work. I can understand that the movie had jerks in the film. That's true, because even the first two films had jerks, okay? Like, we had Walter Peck. He was a complete asshole. We had the mayor's assistant in the second movie, and he was a complete asshole, just like Walter Peck was. So, I would say that the mayor's assistant was just like the one in the second movie, and Mayor Bradley, who was just only there for a while, is close enough to be like Walter P I've seen worse movies out there. I've seen a lot of worse reboots and remakes. This is a time waster for me. But I'm going to say this. No, it's not better than the originals. I'm sorry, but whoever said that obviously is out of their minds. At this rate, Dan Aykroyd is. Because he was the one who said that it's better than the originals. Since he was the one who created Ghostbusters in the first place. Because after all, he is the executive producer. So there you go. <laughs> I guess he had to say what he had to say. But I'm sorry, Dan. But no, there's no way in hell is this movie better than the originals. Okay? 
Especially the second movie. Okay? I don't understand the hate on the second movie. But you know what? If you hated the second film, that's fine. I enjoy the second movie more than ever. Okay? It's not as good as the original film. I can see that. Because I agree, the original is better. But there's no way in hell is this movie better than the sequel nor the original. I, I just don't buy that. It, it just hurts me inside just having to hear that. But all I can say is it, it's okay, but it's just not that great. It's not that good either. It's just totally forgettable. But I could take it as a time waster for what it's worth. The cast was decent, given for what they were doing. I thought uh, Christian Wig did a great job for what she was going for, even though she does fumble at times. Marissa McCarthy, well, um, she was okay. Um, uh, Kate McKinnon as uh, Holtzman just feels quite awkward at times, but I guess I could take it for what it's worth. She's not that bad. I, I like some of the jokes that she comes up with at times, even though she is very weird. Uh, Leslie Jones, I mean, I know some people consider her as a stereotype, but actually, I don't think she's not as bad as some people think. So I, I give her credit for that because, you know, she does come up with some funny lines of dialogue that I can live with. And I know the girls actually did came up with something for a change, even though some of the dialogue w was completely stupid at times. Yeah, Chris Hemsworth is just basically four with geeky glasses, but he acts like a hunk. He's handsome. Yeah, I, I guess Aaron suddenly gets an effect on on Kevin because of his looks. <laughs> but he's basically dumb as rocks. He's just going around doing some stupid things. I mean, he's sort of like a character on the show uh, Game Shakers. Yeah, who was played by Thomas Cluck. So, <laughs> there you go. Well, they have to go for dumb characters these days. But well, why can't they just go for a smart receptionist? <laughs> okay. The cameos was just a nightmare for for me at least. I mean, it just it doesn't work. They didn't really need any cameos to begin with, but they had to do that because, you know, they don't want them to get sued. I mean, especially Bill Murray, which he was he actually got threatened to be sued for that. And I know that sucks because now he gets a deaf scene and a very bad death scene at that and that I just hated. And yes, there were other bad scenes I didn't like either. It's hard to explain, but there you go. Oh, the fact that Ozzy Osbourne is just acting like like he was on the show and all that. And, and the way Dan Aykroyd as, as uh, the New York taxi cab driver acting like um, like he's just what he is, you know, all drunk up, and he's just, he, does, he refused to let Aaron inside the, the cab and all of this. It's just embarrassing. They didn't really need to be there. You know, same goes with uh, Ernie Hudson. Um, also, um, Harold Rambis, the son, was in the movie, too, and but he wasn't in the film that much. But it's also sad that Harold Rambis is no longer with us, and so I know he wasn't in the film. Well, because they actually did the film after he died. so And that's sad. I know Rick Moranis uh, didn't appear in the movie either, so at least he was lucky. Um, the special effects in the film, yep, all done by Sony Imageworks. It's just too cartoonish in so many ways. It looked like it went straight out of a video game. It's it, Yeah, I, I guess you could say it's just like the effects they use in the Scooby-Doo movies, the, the live-action films from the 2000s, which I really, really hated, by the way. But in, in some ways or another, the effects wasn't that good. and they, they, they should have done a whole lot better than this. If they knew they were going to use CGI for the film, then they could have had used better CGI. Okay, I know they're not going to use practical effects that much, but... You know, in the year 2016 that we're in, I guess, you know, all hope it matters that we're hardly ever going to get anything like this. So that sucks. 
The soundtrack, with the exception of that one song by <sighs> Fall Out Boy um, that's featuring Missy Elliott, which was a horrible song, by the way. Definitely a horrible redemption of the Ghostbusters theme from Ray Parker Jr. I'm sorry, but that song was just horrible. It didn't need to be there. I heard that song already. It was a piece of shit. But it's amazing that they actually put the song right in the middle of the scene with the Ecto-1. And the Ghostbusters ready to suit up just to go inside the concert. I hated that song. It just doesn't work. It was terrible. But the songs that went after it was not that bad at all. I actually did enjoy a different cover version of the Ray Parker Jr. theme that's done by Walk the Moon. So I thought it definitely... Um, it definitely is a homage to uh, the original theme. It definitely sets it straight. It, it definitely has uh, the feel to it, so I love that. And I also have some other songs, too. Even uh, the song Girl Girls by uh, Ralph Schneider's daughter, uh, Elle Keen. So I thought that was good. I love that song. So it wasn't that bad. I'll give you that. But as far as the film's concerned, it deserves better. But there's no way in hell that it's better than the originals. Because let's face it, the originals will always be the classics. So is the TV series, uh, The Real Ghostbusters, along with Extreme Ghostbusters. Because that's the best one we, we ever had after The Real Ghostbusters. That should have been the movie, by the way. When you have you know, a mixed gender cast, which I think I would have preferred too. That would have been nice. And they come up with a whole new generation, but I guess it's okay to have a female cast as long as they come up with better jokes and all that. And the direction that Paul Feig has done, I think he could have done a whole lot better for what he was given. And I wish he had written the script better with uh, his partner Kate Depoid, who had a cameo in the film as the, the rental agent. Yeah, that was her, by the way. I just wish they'd come up with better jokes. Just to make this movie more smart and intelligent. I mean, that's what made the original good in the first place. Because it, it had a smart and intelligent script. That was written by Harold Ramis and Dan Aykroyd. And it was directed by Ira Reitman. Because he did a good job... You know, doing a film like this uh, after he did Stripes with Bill Murray. It was definitely the perfect uh, choice for a comedy. A fantasy comedy. With horror elements towards it. So it worked. I just wish this movie had that. And that's how I felt. But, what can you do? And now that the movie's a flop making its budget for $144 million, going worldwide of $193 million, <laughs> which already the film has been banned in China. They're just not doing so well to make a possible sequel. And that's sad, because that's it looks to me like it's never going to happen. So, I guess they have to move on. <laughs> so, definitely learn their lesson from making a reboot like Ghostbusters. Next time, when you do films like this, try to find better material. Don't write all these offensive jokes involving uh, males. Don't make them look like idiots. Okay? But on top of that, uh, the mayor's assistant was was a bitch anyway, so I'll give you that. <laughs> and then come up with some funny jokes that doesn't go for for the stupid. Because then you'll have a better movie. And there you go. And the fact that this movie has a certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes completely surprised me. Because I figured I was going to give this movie a chance at least. But the fact that this movie got a positive feedback from critics, you know, some of which are negative um, for some people. Yeah, because some of them, including the audience, had totally dismissed it as they saw it. Because they knew that this movie was going to be bad. In fact, I know one of the critics actually said, um, the girls are funny. Get over it. 
And then there's another person that just defends it despite of all the backlash it's getting. But there you go. But I'll give you this though. If you love the movie, I'm cool with it. But if you hated this movie with a passion, then don't bother seeing this movie. Or or just or even if you have seen it already, then and you hated it so much, then and you don't want to see it again, well. <laughs> then I'm, I'm glad that you felt that way because I, I definitely respect your opinion and I'm glad everything's good for you guys because I agree. I'm just gonna dismiss this as a time waster. It's okay. It's fine, but I agree. The movie's not as good as I thought it would be. It's just totally forgettable. So with that aside, I give Ghostbusters from 2016 the new reboot with an all-female cast, two and a half stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.